Ladies and gentlemen, it gives me immense pleasure to invite the now speaker of today, Mr. Zaki Shahan, founder EB Obsession and Solar Love, president, important media director and editor, Clean Technica. Ladies and gentlemen, a round of applause for Mr. Zaki Shahan. He is one of the world's most renowned solar energy, electric car, energy storage, and wind energy experts. Featured on top 20 list with Mr. Elon Musk and President Obama for his influence on fuel economy matters. Generally speaking, uh, I like the phrase the, "the future is now," and that's sort of what this presentation is about. But this presentation is also about uh, just a stable fact of life. And ironically, it's that we have change, change, change. It's very easy to get in the mindset that today is what we will have tomorrow, is what we will have the next day, is what we will have 10 years from now. But if you look back on time, 10 years ago looked very different, 20 years ago looked very different, 50 years ago looked like another world. Today is very different from what we're going to have in 10 years, and that's because things change fast. So if this was a top cell phone, on the market, how many of you thought you would have a cell phone in your lifetime? How many of you thought you would have a cell phone in your lifetime that can do what it can do? You didn't think so. I didn't think so. I certainly, when I was in high school, I thought I would have that uh, cordless electronic phone for I thought, why would I get a cell phone? I don't need a cell phone. I don't need to talk to people when I'm out of my house. Uh, it's a common mindset that we think, we have a hard time seeing why we would change to something new. Uh, until it's, it's our time to change. Uh, other people, I'm sure, thought they would use that kind of phone, the rotary phone for ages. Some people thought they would use this kind of phone for, uh, that this would be around 50 years. Obviously, things change and things change fast once it's their time to change, once the technology is right. And the key is the technology has to be right. Uh, looking at computers, um, it's hard to see this, but you know, this is an old IBM computer. When this, and there's another one that's even older, when, they, when these were the top computers in the world, very few people had any clue what computers would become, how powerful they would become, what we'd be able to do on, on them, that we would ever have an internet. There's a great story from, uh, from, a, from a, a very successful businessman uh, who started uh, what's now Oracle. Um, and, and it also started Better Place, which was an EV startup that, that died. But um, he basically told a story about how he pitched his, that he and his father pitched their software product to a lot of people. They, they had like four or something potential uh, buyers who were going to buy out the company. One after another, they started calling and saying, well, we really like what you have, but we're really not sure about the underlying architecture. Uh, and they canceled, and they canceled, and they canceled. The underlying architecture was the internet. These big players weren't really sure if the internet was ever going to become anything, or what its use would be. Uh, so things change fast. This is a picture of Bill Gates in the 70s, I think, uh, with a 10 megabyte, megabyte hard disk for $3,500. A couple, about a month ago, I bought a 2 million megabyte hard disk for about $100. The, the shift is so dramatic that we can't even process it mentally, I think. Uh, and the key is that this technology hit uh, a, a competitive point, and then it started improving, improving, uh, exponentially growing exponentially, the cost came down exponentially, and we see, we see this happen time and time again. Uh, and you know, this is the phone we have today that's several times more powerful than these computers, much uh, different than those phones we just looked at, and they've changed people's lives. One key, of course, is the price has to be right. When the price is right, that's when we see these dramatic changes. That's when we see disruption in a marketplace. That's when we see a giant like Kodak go bankrupt. That's when we see giant businesses that we thought would be around forever disappear. Now, before we go further, it's, it's really under, important to understand how disruption occurs. Because we're very fond of this term now, we have a whole conference here about it. But there's still a little bit of confusion. Now, if you look at the beginning of this, this graph, it's very slow. If you just cut off 
the first 1% or 2% of that growth trend, it looks very minimal. And it looks, if you project it linearly, in a linear fashion, it looks like it's not going to make any difference for decades to come. But that's the thing about disruptive technology. It happens in such a way, in such a pattern, and in such a fashion, that it surprises almost everyone. That's why it's disruptive. Because it surprises people. Because forecasts that we all think are correct are wildly conservative, wildly off the mark. This is, again, this is a look at the growth trends. You can't read this well, sorry. The growth trends of various popular uh, electronics and technologies. So telephones, stoves, microwaves, refrigerators. Uh, and this shows even, this is again an S curve, but look at this. Look at the initial growth phase of these. So this is autos on the left, color TV, microwave, and again, uh, mobile phones that I've highlighted. The growth trend here, okay, it's, they're growing, these are growing markets, but they're not particularly exciting. They're not really about to shake up any inter industry, right? If you talk to people in the industries that are leading these markets at that time, they probably say, oh, well, these are going to grow a lot in the next few years, but they're not going to really change our industry that much. But look at what happens a, a couple years later, or even a year later, or a few years later. The growth goes through the roof. It goes, it disrupts the heck out of the market. Because all of a sudden, the price is right. Uh, so let's get into to how this relates to clean technology. So this is just a fun chart. Um, this, is, this shows energy potential from different energy sources. The renewables show annual energy potential. So this is how much energy potential is hitting the world every year from renewables. On the side are the total known reserves of fossil fuels. So this is total known energy potential of fossil fuels. So that giant yellow thing is solar energy. That's not the background. That's the, that's the energy potential of solar. It dwarfs everything else. Wind is, is also notable, but it's really solar there. This, earlier the, the gentleman from Sun Edison made a, made a wonderful talking point about how the cost of solar PV has dropped. The cost of solar PV cells has dropped 100 times over since the 1970s. It's dropped from $76.67 a watt to, well in this chart it's 2013, $0.74 cents a watt. Uh, now it's even down to $0.62 cents a watt a couple years later. And I did, a, I did an article for the Economist Group uh, where, I, where I interviewed a number of top researchers in the solar energy field. And the projection I got is that by 20, uh, let me make sure I got the year right, by 2040, the price of a solar cell will drop from 62 cents a watt to 21 cents a watt with no breakthroughs in the technology. That's just from the, the economies of scale and incremental improvements in technology. So the price of a solar cell is supposed to drop a third. Uh, and as the gentleman from, from Sub Edison already said, solar is already competitive. So what does that mean? Here's a chart from uh, Bernstein analysis. Uh, I love it because, well, I love it for a couple reasons. First of all, that, that dropping line is the cost of solar. All the other lines are natural gas, coal. It's just like, wow. What, what, what does that show you is around the corner? What does that tell you is the next phase of energy? Is it that coal and natural gas are going to keep growing like they have been? I don't freaking think so. <laughs> and the, the thing I love about this chart, so it comes from a you know, conservative analysis team, and they named it, Welcome to the Terror Dome. Welcome to the Terror Dome. This is like, uh, this, this, is, this is the message they're portraying with the graphic and everything else. This is a recent chart that, uh, that uh, we just published about. It shows that drop in, sol in the price of solar on the left, the orange, which it does not look like orange here, uh, and on the right is the growth of solar. So this is solar power uh, additions every year. So on the right, it's not it's not total solar installed globally. It's each year how much is added. That's why you see a little dip one year. So as the price has been dropping, uh, the growth has been rising very fast. Uh, this is a, this is, these are some fun charts um, 
focus on the U.S., but it's really important to understand, I, I think, uh, I don't know the story in, in India, how long it takes to build a coal power plant or a nuclear power plant, but the U.S. is about six to eight years. Uh, so projected six to eight years out, the cost of coal, the coal power plant, a couple years ago, was 11 cents. Uh, that's when the power plant would be finished, and at that time, you could build solar for 7 cents a kilowatt hour. So basically, you couldn't build a coal power plant today, a new coal power plant that would compete with solar when that plant is finished. It's just out of the question. Uh, the same is true for nuclear. The funny thing about these charts, these charts were made two years ago. The price they projected for 2020 for solar was 7 cents a kilowatt hour. This chart, this recent analysis from Lazar, it shows the, the levelized cost of energy as between 7 cents a kilowatt hour and 8.5 and cents a kilowatt hour today. We've seen record low prices of under, four, under 5 cents and then under 4 cents a kilowatt hour in Dubai, in, the, in Texas, in the United States. India is hitting 8 cents a kilowatt hour or even lower. Um, so we're already seeing these projections from 2020 from a couple years ago. In other words, no matter who is projecting the future of solar, they're projecting it too conservatively. Time and again, the, the wonderful presentation for the VP uh, gentleman noted that they keep having to revise their renewable energy projections every year because they're, they're, not, they're, they're too off, they're too conservative. Because they keep surprising people. Now these are, these are one, two, three years out projections. What about a 10, 20, 30 year projection? These projections uh, for 20, 30 years from now are ridiculously conservative because they don't get the exponential growth, the truly exponential and breakthrough growth of solar. Uh, so this chart here shows today solar energy, the levelized cost of solar, just as, in case anyone's not familiar, levelized cost of, of energy is basically the cost of energy coming from a power plant over the lifetime of the power plant. The assumption is generally like 20, 25 years for the power plant's life. Solar and wind, uh, solar panels, wind turbines actually last many decades, but from a financial perspective, they keep it uh, 20 to 25 years. So even today, the levelized cost of energy from solar is, as, is, is cheaper, basically, on average, than any fossils or any nuclear. This is globally. Uh, the projection for 2017, next year, is 6 cents a kilowatt hour, which is the minimum you have for natural gas combined cycle and it beats everything else, except for wind. Cuts right through the middle of wind, which is the cheapest form of new electricity. Uh, so that's, that's utility scale, those are solar power plants. But it also, you know, consider rooftop solar doesn't compete with wholesale solar prices, wholesale electricity prices. Rooftop solar competes with retail electricity. So here, it's very hard to see with the screen, but basically the top circle is the price of retail electricity in these locations, and the bottom diamond is the price of rooftop solar in these locations. So in a growing number of places around the world, it's cheaper to get electricity from a rooftop solar panel than it is from the grid. And this trend, you know, as I just noted, the price of a solar cell is expected to drop from 62 cents to 21 cents per watt. So this trend is only going to grow, and quite quickly. As I just noted, wind is actually even cheaper. So wind is the only electricity source that can beat solar on a pure price basis. The difference, one difference, there are many differences, but one difference is that solar produces electricity at points of very high demand in the middle of the day when you're running an air conditioner and you need a lot of electricity, which makes that electricity very valuable. Wind, it depends on the location, but often will produce electricity uh, at night, which is low demand time. But still, you can see here uh, in the, with, with the box around it that wind and wind is the cheapest option for new electricity. And global wind uh, growth has been growing rapidly as well, just like solar. Why not faster, though? You know, we've seen uh, again a wonderful presentation from the BP man who, who said uh, that it's still not fast enough to address global climate change. We're still not not hitting the, the target scientists say we have to hit. Uh, the, the big barriers to faster growth, in my opinion, are largely related to inertia. Uh, government inertia, corporate inertia, and general societal mental inertia. 
Inertia controls far too much of our life, unfortunately. Uh, here's, a, here's a quote, it's our job to keep things at a manageable pace through strategic application of bureaucratic inertia. In some cases, inertia actually does help to avoid rapid changes that we don't want. In this case, it limits rapid growth of renewable energy. Uh, here's a quote from Napoleon Hill, nothing is more tragic or more common than mental inertia. Unfortunately, this, I think, is the number one barrier to clean tech adoption today. Because people don't realize solar and wind, as we have even heard several times today from it, very uh, educated, smart people, uh, they thought that renewables were more expensive. I, I guess in India you have a unique case with coal, okay? So uh, I might not yeah, be representing that. But basically, across the world, people think solar and wind are much more expensive than they are. If they have a price in their head of solar from five years ago, it's probably twice as high as the price today or even more. If they have a price in their head from a few decades ago, it's a hundred times higher. So people just, they, they, they don't realize, and then societally we don't move and we don't realize how fast the prices drop and the fact that solar and wind are cost competitive today in a very large number of places. Here's a quote from Captain Jack Sparrow. Do you know that, that guy who's a historical uh, figure? No, he's from the Pirates of the Caribbean. But the problem is not the problem, the problem is your attitude about the problem. And I see that time and time again with solar and wind energy and with electric vehicles. We have misconceptions about the problem and about solutions to the problem. Eventually though, inertia is on, on our side. We have the snowball effect, we have exponential growth. This shows stages of adoption on, a, on an S-curve. So first we have the initial pioneers, the 2%. Then we have optimists who jump in 14% and pragmatists. Of course, they categorize them in a different way. They try to put these people in boxes. But basically, this is how technologies grow time and time again by uh, a rapid uptake eventually hitting the masses. Uh, this is a presentation from Bloomberg New Energy Finance uh, last year, which showed that for the first time in history, more clean energy capacity was added globally than fossil fuel capacity, and that that would never, never go back. That clean energy would, year after year, add more capacity than fossil fuels going forward. And again, last year, Bloomberg reported, clean energy added more capacity than fossil fuels. But you, again, you need a catalyst. You need something that comes in and shakes up inertia, that wakes people up and says, let's get moving, let's, let's adopt this new option, this new technology. Price, as I said, is one catalyst, but it's not the only catalyst. Because most, most people aren't going to be aware of price changes that, that sensitively. And most, a lot of people don't act just on price. Other than price, disruptive technology often has to be simply better. It has to be something where you see it and you say, I want that technology. I don't want this old technology. I want the new technology. It has to have something that calls out and says, we are better than, than this. This is a picture of Paris. Who wants to visit Paris on a day like this? Would you like to go sightseeing in Paris? You can hardly see the Eiffel Tower there. Oh, I went to Paris, I couldn't really see much. It was so, uh, excuse my <laughs> language. It was so freaking uh, smoggy. This is, this is the Paris we want to see. This is the Paris, this is the city we want to live in. Mumbai is plagued with, with smog. Delhi is plagued with smog. It's a real unfortunate scenario that we see playing out time and time again that the United States fell and followed the same mistakes that London followed. That China followed the same mistakes that the US followed. That India is following the same mistakes that the US followed. Where you let your cities be covered in pollution, you ruin the quality of life of your population because of mental and institutional inertia regarding clean energy. You have the potential today, and I, in an interview with CNBC five years ago, I talked about the potential for India and other developing countries to leapfrog dirty energy sources of the past and jump right into solar energy, clean energy, just like India did and many developing uh, countries did with uh, phones. Leapfrogging landlines and jumping right into cell phones. Unfortunately, there's still this assumption that we have to have dirty energy. Why the heck do we have to kill ourselves prematurely? Really. We don't. We have cost competitive solar and wind. This is a presentation from Tesla, Tesla CEO Elon Musk, 
when they were unveiling the Model X. This, this is research they conducted, uh, basically finding the most conservative case they could for how much, uh, you, how early, how prematurely people die in various cities from air pollution. Uh, in Beijing, two years of your life, on average, are cut because of air pollution. In Mexico City, 10 months. In Oslo, five months. Uh, in Delhi and Bombay, I don't think anybody here really wants to see the numbers of how prematurely you die. And unfortunately, it's not just about a statistic, it's not just about a number. That early death is accompanied, accompanied by horrific suffering. What's the price of dying early? What's the price of suffering through cancer or other problems because of pollution that you thought was necessary even though it wasn't? What's the price of that? Economists can't price it. They make assumptions, they put a price on it, and we just take that. But this is a, this is a great cost. Global warming, of course. Global warming is the issue today facing, uh, it's basically threatening the future of human society. Uh, we just published uh, on a new scientific study that said we have 10,000 years of, of uh, sea level rise on our way if we don't turn things around fast. 10,000 years of sea level rise that we cannot reverse if we don't cut our emissions very quickly, much more quickly than the BP report just projected, the energy outlook. And this is, and even under two, per, two, even under two degrees Celsius temperature rise, which is the common target for a lot of people, 20% of the world population will have to move. 20% of the world population will have to migrate because their cities will be underwater. So that's, a, that's really something, you know, it's an existential threat to human society. We have to consider that. So aside from clean energy, another key solution is electric transport. This is uh, me standing next to a Tesla Model S in Amsterdam, beautiful vehicle. Uh, electric vehicles, again, they have many of the same benefits that clean energy have. They cut air pollution, they reduce our human suffering, they cut global warming. And they do cut, you know, someone asked earlier about that, uh, electric motors are three to four times more efficient than internal combustion engines. That's what runs a gasoline car. So, just inherently, they're three to four times more efficient. Studies have been conducted over and over, even on a, the dirtiest grid you can, you have to basically find a grid that's 100% coal before electric vehicles are not going to be greener than a Toyota Prius, or the most efficient hybrid gasoline car. Uh, and you know, that's, if, if you take into account the fact that we're transitioning to renewables, uh, electric vehicles are many, many times more efficient. You can drive on sunshine, you can drive on the wind, and you have zero emissions at all. Uh, other than those factors, electric vehicles uh, address oil shocks. This is a picture from the oil shock of the 70s. They, they help reduce our susceptibility to global price changes in, in, in oil and gas. Uh, here's a picture from Europe. Europe imports 1 billion euros worth of oil every day. This is money that these countries are sending to other countries around the world and large corporations every day because of their addiction to oil. India is a very similar situation. How much money, I wonder, is India sending abroad every day because of this addiction to oil? Um, but these, for me, the two biggest factors that are going to drive electric vehicle adoption aren't any of those things. I think those things are wonder wonderful benefits, but the things that will drive electric vehicle adoption that actually really make electric vehicles a disruptive technology in my mind are consumer benefits. Electric vehicles are just a lot more fun to drive. You have an instant torque, which means you have all the power of the car right when you step on the pedal available to you. This is not the case with the gasoline car. This is a ton of fun. You have video after video of people stepping on the pedal of an electric car and laughing. Uh, they have what you call an EV smile that people say they, have, they get for years after getting an electric car. You get in your car, you drive, and you have a smile. Instant power, extremely quiet, extremely smooth. It's a much better driving experience. And aside from those of us who just love to step on the pedal and have a lot of fun, it also provides benefits to, for example, my mother, who just wants to drive more safely. It's much easier to get into traffic, to merge into traffic, to get onto a highway, to get into a roundabout, because you have that instant torque. So it reduces the stress of driving, and there's a lot of stress in driving. 
Uh, aside from the fun and the, the smooth and quiet and powerful ride of an electric car, they're also super convenient, which is ironically the opposite of what the media focuses on. Uh, nine, about 80 to 90 percent of charging you do when you when you get home. You, you get home, you plug in. It takes two to three seconds. People have plugged it, have timed it. Uh, you unplug when you leave, and it's two to three seconds. This saves the time that you have to spend finding a gas station, getting off the highway, getting out of the car, pumping the gas, get paying for the gas, perhaps buying some junk food in the gas station they shoot by getting back in the car, getting back on the highway, etc. This adds up very quickly. There's great time saving savings and convenience savings from electric cars. Uh, of course, not everybody has a garage at home, but even in such cases, you can often get, uh, you know, if, if this moves along uh, well enough in your location, uh, on-street electric car charging, also workplace charging offers the same benefit. So, eventually, as the charging network fills out, this will be a, a benefit for all consumers, basically. So these two consumer benefits, I think, are what make electric vehicles a disruptive technology. Here's a wonderful quote from Sheikh Yamani, former Saudi oil minister. The stone age came to an end not for lack of stones, and the oil age will come to an end not for lack of oil. Uh, he had a great foresight. Today, uh, OPEC might not agree with him. But uh, this is a slide that Tesla Motors CTO JP Strubel ends a lot of presentations with, the Sheikh Yamani one. Uh, but again, so we have to get to the price competitiveness. If, if electric cars remain too, too expensive up, up front, you know, we're going to see a slow transition, slow growth, slow adoption. Uh, this chart comes from a, a McKinsey report. It's a little complicated, but basically shows where the price of batteries it shows the competitiveness of electrified vehicles compared, comparing price of batteries to price of gasoline. If you look at the bottom corner, for example, it shows that if batteries cost about $150 a kilowatt hour and gas costs about $2 a gallon, uh, electric cars are competitive with gas cars. Not including the benefits we already talked about, all of those benefits of electric cars. So this is just on a pure cost rationality basis. So what's happening with EV battery prices? This is a, 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 from a study published in the journal Nature last year. It shows that EV battery pack costs are coming down in a great fashion. And furthermore, that costs today are often lower than projections for EV battery costs in 2020. So again, EV battery pack costs are coming down quicker than projected. Uh, those arrows are indicating Model S and these on leaf battery prices and projections for 2020. Last year, GM announced a partnership with LG Chem, where LG Chem is providing GM with battery cells at a cost of $145 a kilowatt hour. If you add in the other pack costs, I made some assumptions for other battery pack costs to, to come up with the figures that would fit this chart. And uh, basically that means that GM's new, uh, GM is bringing to market the first long range affordable electric car in the U.S., uh, $30,000 uh, $30, dollars car after incentives. And it basically, this, this chart shows that it's competitive with gasoline between $2.50 a gallon to $3 a gallon. That's still not quite competitive purely on a cost basis, not including those consumer benefits, but it's getting there. And pad costs are coming down fast. Uh, Jeffrey's analyst projected that current Tesla batteries cost $250 a kilowatt hour and the battery pack cost will come down to $130 a kilowatt hour when the Tesla Gigafactory is completed in Nevada or when it starts operation in 2017. Um, the Tesla Gigafactory is going to be the largest building on, in the world based on footprint and it will produce as many batteries each year as were produced globally by all companies in 2014. So it's, it shows a, a doubling of battery capacity those economies of scale are going to bring down costs significantly. Elon Musk has said repeatedly that the cost will drop 30% from Tesla batteries just based on simple improvements from the, from the Gigafactory, not on any breakthroughs. So, putting that into the chart, it shows that, uh, that Gigafactory estimates for, for this analyst are the lowest one. The other analysts have estimated higher. 
Though on a Tesla call last week, conference call last week, Elon noted that most of the projections he sees for EV battery prices are much higher than they're, than they're looking at. So again, the most ambitious projection is probably the most likely. Um, and it's showing that Tesla's vehicles, particularly the long-range affordable Model 3 that comes out next year, uh, will be competitive with gasoline cars at under $2 a gallon of gasoline. This is basically putting cars competitive with, uh, with gasoline cars, electric cars competitive with gasoline cars. Uh, again, it's a niche market. We're just starting. But we've seen the growth trends and technologies once the price is right and people begin to realize the consumer benefits. Uh, people are in love with Tesla. We've already heard Tesla mentioned a couple times today because it's pr produced the best cars in the world. The Tesla Model S is quicker than all but six production cars in history, and it's much cheaper, and those other cars are about two seats, seat about two people, while the Model S seats five to seven people. So it's a, it's a dramatic shift and a dramatic improvement in technology. And uh, I think automakers see it coming because large automaker after large automaker is announcing plans for a long-range electric car. These are all announcements from the past six months or so. Uh, Audi, Porsche, Mitsubishi, Nissan, Chevy Bolt, uh, the Chevy Bolt, the, the one one on the bottom is the GM car we just talked about. Uh, but there's another big barrier to electric cars. And anyone uh, who's following this market needs to be aware that they are still, they still have a consumer weakness when it comes to charging because uh, it takes much longer to charge an electric car. If you're charging at home or at the workplace, this just doesn't really matter. Like I said, you plug in, you do other things, you hang out with your family, it charges by itself, you don't have to worry about it. Uh, but if you're talking about taking road trips or if you're talking about selling people on a car based on their idea that they might need to drive across the country one, all of a sudden, which unfortunately is what a lot of people think they, they're going to do with a car, um, then you need faster charging. So all current automakers, their electric cars, except for Tesla, charge the fastest like 75 to 100 miles uh, in, in 30 minutes. If you, if you drive for two to three hours and you have to charge for one hour, an hour and a half, every two to three hours, it's really not convenient, it's not practical. So electric cars are not going to replace uh, gasoline cars unless they're more competitive in this, in this respect, I think. Tesla offers supercharging, which is 170 miles in 30 minutes, which means you can drive for two to three hours and then charge for 30 minutes. And basically that's actually recommended from a health perspective. That makes your drive more enjoyable. You get out, you use the bathroom, you get some coffee, eat, something like that change your baby's diaper, as the case may be. Um, so Tesla's grown this supercharger network across the US, across Europe, it's growing across Asia now. It's the most integrated network, it's by far the fastest charging network, twice as fast as anything else. This is plans for 2016. Uh, this is a critical component, so this and battery costs, those are the two barriers that remain when there's about eight benefits to electric cars. You knock down those two barriers and you have eight benefits to electric cars, basically no disadvantages, and the price is about to be right, is, is competitive. So that is a fun, that's the price is right. That's the point where electric cars become the next smartphone or the next cell phone and take over the market, in my opinion. Um, but again, only Tesla is really progressing this. There's a long talk we could go into another day about why conventional automakers are so slow in this regard. Uh, but basically, you know, we've seen it in industry after industry where the incumbent leaders are not that incentivized to eat into their, mar their existing market share. Automakers are not that eager to do away with all of their IP, all of their competitive advantage man manufacturing electric uh, gasoline cars. This is where their competitive advantage is. So they're not that eager to go. Luckily, we have Tesla, which is basically disrupting the market. We did a survey with over te uh, 2,000 respondents last, late last year um, about a lot of matters, but one matter was how much more attractive they were to a fully electric car if it had access to the Tesla supercharger network, or a comparable fast charge, super fast charging network, which today does not exist at all. Um, and the respondents, only 10% said they didn't really care. So basically 90% of respondents were very, thought this was a very important matter with the car that they buy. 
Not surprisingly, the cars they're most likely to buy were Teslas. Uh, here's current EV drivers. The top three cars they're most likely to buy next are the Tesla Model 3, the Tesla Model X, and the Tesla Model S. So, uh, unfortunately, nobody else is really competing here yet. Uh, similar when you ask about how excited they are. We just published an article from a, an Indian researcher um, who was talking about what needs to happen in the electric car market in India to, make, to kick it off because it's been a boom-bust market that hasn't really gone very far. Uh, we just published this on Clean Technica this morning, actually. I edited it on the plane on the way here. Um, and he, he made the case that, that uh, Indian startups need to move in this direction as well and offer, uh, basically follow the Tesla model. I think he's onto something. But again, looking at how disruption occurs. So that box right there shows the, basically the electric car market today in most places. It's about 1% or less, or maybe a little more in France. Uh, so if you look at the growth trend at that phase of, of the electric car market, it looks pretty depressing if you want electric cars to, to grow, and it looks pretty non-threatening if you're an oil company or main, main gasoline manufacturer. But as we've seen, you get past a few percent and change, things change very quickly. Tesla offers Right now, the only car that's mass manufacturing has been the Tesla Model S, which is a large luxury sedan, or performance sedan, technically. But Tesla right now has 25% of the large luxury market in the US, similar in Europe. So Tesla's basically at this point in the curve, uh, in the, lu in the luxury, large luxury car segment. Same with Norway. The son of MSN uh, gentleman mentioned Norway earlier. 25% of new cars sold in Norway are electric cars. Uh, and it's basically, last year, it was about 13%. So basically, it's following this curve to a T. This is uh, already happening. This is the chain market share, uh, sales change of all the lar of large luxury cars in the US market last year. So every large luxury car lost sales, except for the Tesla Model S, which grew 51%. Again, it's disrupting the market already. It's starting in the large luxury category. Cell phones, they started in an, in an expensive category for the rich. Smartphones, the same. Computers, the same. That's how technology disruption occurs. You start in a higher end market that funds the growth that fuels the next market, which fuels the next market, which fuels the next market. And that's what's happening with Tesla electric cars. This is a chart of 2015 sales. Tesla beat the Mercedes-Benz S-Class. Uh, in the US, and it's about a similar story in Europe, surprisingly. Uh, and it's more than even if you combine all BMW large luxury sedans. This is Tesla's uh, total number of Teslas on the road each year, uh, practically doubling every year. Uh, so, generally, the story is that the future is starting right now. The future of technology is already here. The early adopters are already adopting. In some cases, the first followers. In some cases, the, the mass market. Uh, so we already have the technologies. In 10, 20 years, the projections you see for solar, wind, electric cars, I bet money, if you looked back on them in 10 and 20 years, you would laugh. You'd be like, wow, those people were way off. It happened with cell phones. Projections in like 1995 for cell phone sales in 2000 were like 100 times too, too low or something like that. It was a ridiculous um, failure on the part of forecasters because time and time again, they have a tendency not to see disruption before it occurs, and that's why we call it disruption. Uh, but this is, uh, you know, this is a future solar solar charging electric cars, we can drive our vehicles on sunshine, sunlight, wind, and we don't have the problems of pollution, the premature death that we have from fossil fuels. Thank you very much. I know there's time for questions. Hopefully there is. And now, while we're waiting for questions, I'll add a couple more stats that I was going to show. Last year in the U.S., 70% or 69% of new power capacity was from renewables. The year before, over 50% of new power capacity was from renewables. Uh, the, the only other source last year basically was natural gas at about 30%. So we talk about the hype of the, the shale gas market in, in the US, but it's, it's not even half of the renewable energy growth last year in the US.
Oh, and one more, okay, one more fun stat. So a recent OPEC energy outlet, out, you know, BP just had an energy outlet report, OPEC had one of them about a month ago, 470 page report, and its expectation was that EV battery prices would drop about 50% in the next 20 years. Last year, EV battery prices dropped 35% alone. So who here thinks EV battery prices are only going to drop 50% in the next 20 years? I was interviewing the, the founder of Bloomberg New Energy Finance. We were talking, uh, he's now the, the chairman of the advisory board, and he was laughing about this projection because it's so, it's, it's so ridiculous. And that's what its whole energy outlook for electric vehicles is based on. So something to think about. Yeah. I have a question here. Uh, wearing a futurist hat, I've always, always wondered about one thing. You know, the sun never sets in space. So why don't we generate solar power in space and leave it down to Earth? It'll eliminate transmission and generation. Yeah, well, it's been discussed, and it's been a story that pops up here and there every year. I think um, Japan's doing some research on the matter. I mean, the, the problem is uh, just the cost of solar is so low on Earth uh, that it's hard to compete with, and same for wind. And uh, the cost of, of putting solar panels in space. Some people think it might be competitive one day. I, I don't really see it. I mean, maybe someday in the very distant future. But right now, solar and wind can already take over. They're already pretty, can, 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 can dominate new electricity capacity. Um, a quick one on batteries. Uh, you, today's batteries generate a lot of uh, waste pollution. So if you're going to have all cars powered by batteries, what do we do with the basis of the energy? Well, luckily batteries are extremely uh, popular for recycling. Uh, battery recycling rates in the U.S. are something like 95%. Um, there's great value uh, in used batteries for energy storage. They can be used to help the grid with energy storage. We're seeing a lot of pilot projects with that. Also, uh, just companies are planning to recycle them. Tesla at the Gigafactory is building a facility to recycle used batteries and almost recycle you know, most of the parts. So this is a huge, uh, again, thing that's going to, I think, facilitate faster EV price drops and improvements. Um, the mining unit, yeah, it's an issue to, to address. Uh, those, those analyses talking about how clean electric cars are, most of them take that into account, with the, electric, the environmental cost of mining. Uh, they're still much greener, but of course there's a lot, of, a lot of improvement can always be made. And generally, I mean, there's a lot of value in using batteries, so they should be recycled. Or, or used as grid storage, which is very, very likely. So my question is on this, because this Tesla came up with a presentation. A uh, few uh, disruption theory says... Uh, Questions with respect to Tesla, uh, uh, the disruption theory, uh, particularly in the data and description, says that uh, uh, based on his theory, uh, it doesn't look like, so it, it might that the electric car market might get disrupted, but Tesla will not be able to make money because it has not started from the bottom of the pyramid. Uh, so have you thought about it or do you think it makes sense? Or? I'm not sure if I follow. The question is if electric cars can't succeed unless they start from the bottom. No, I'm saying the electric car market could get disrupted, uh, but Tesla has started from sedan, not particularly from the bottom of the, uh, from a small car or a big car, it actually started from the top, top end. So, it will not be able to make money, that is what the disruption theory says, because it is competing oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. with the, yeah. the, all the big guys are ready to fight it out. Yeah. The market will uh, get disrupted, but Tesla will not be able to make money. Yeah, no, I think that theory looks at exceptions more than rule. I mean, generally speaking, like I said, with cell phones, computers, you start at the more expensive end because the early adopters are willing to pay a premium for a premium product, and that funds further growth. Uh, Tesla is expecting to be profitable for the full year this year, first time, uh, on non-GAAP financing, uh, and profitable in the fourth quarter on GAAP financing, uh, and really non-GAAP financing in the auto industry because of the way they segment leasing is more appropriate. But basically, 
Uh, and also this entire year it expects to be net cash flow positive uh, and start starting next quarter, which means basically it doesn't it's not going to need to take any financing outside beyond asset based lending uh, because of the, the funding it has from Tesla Model S and Model, Model X is going into the, the factories and production, the design and development of the Gigafactory, the Model 3, the Tesla energy business. So it's these high-end products that fund the slightly less high-end products that fund the mass market products that fund the cheap product for the masses. This is what happens in technology and after technology. I mean, cell phones didn't take over the market from the low end. They took over the market from the high end. Same with smartphones, same with refrigerators, microwaves, etc. Hi. There are three uh, questions I have, uh, which are interrelated. First of all, like uh, all lower population is uh, ready to accept uh, this disruption and uh, accept the solar energy consumption. But the main part is uh, compared to other alternative energies, installation of a solar panel in the plane is expensive. Number one. Number two, uh, if I'm using plastic cells then the lifespan of plastic cells is lesser than the silicon cells. So again there, my costing goes a little higher. And third one is like uh, when storage of solar energy, for that I'm using powder based batteries, which is again costing me higher. So out of these three factors, uh, which one you, uh, in which uh, factor you can see there can be a sizable amount of drop in costing so that uh, my uh, energy consumption becomes a little cheaper because this is like you know uh, solar energy the source of energy from sun is uh, for free yeah. only the first and last portion is costing me high yeah i mean as the first one the first one is basically what we call soft costs of solar and they've, they've become a more disproportionate cost of the total and total cost of solar in other places in the us they're twice as high as in germany or australia this is regarding labor, permitting. Permitting is a big problem in some places. Governments can help. Uh, uh, a lot of other costs. They're coming down as well. Uh, they're coming down in the same fashion. Uh, but it's something to keep working on. Um, regarding, uh, what was the second? plant. So, you know, various solar technologies, organic solar cells, uh, um, CSP. Uh, CPV have been you know hyped over the years, but they've just been unable to compete with with conventional crystalline solar PV for the most part. Uh, most of the market, and it's just hard to see anything competing with that uh, in the mass market going forward. So you know the, their their costs are are just uh, too high on a kilowatt hour basis. Um, as far as storage, yeah, well. Something that's really widely misunderstood is we don't need a lot of storage. To, we don't need a lot of storage at all for mostly renewables or for even entirely renewables. We need some later, but even to get up to 30% renewables in a lot of on a lot of grids, you don't have to do anything. Basically, you have to make some slight changes to how the grid works, maybe to how you integrate. But it's not until you get to like 30% where you really need to start uh, making some changes to integrate. And it's not until about 60% where you really need storage. And most places are far off of that. Like the sun, as the gentleman said earlier, in the summer, Germany is getting about 50% from solar on days. Um, it's now needing to start thinking about how to get, you know, how to how to integrate further. But most places don't. I mean, it's good to plan for that. But these are things that, that um, are forecasted to, to growth projects, price price projection, projections, planning, etc. And they're not really that big of a barrier. Um, I think. Yeah. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm showing a brief. Last but not the least, Mr. Zahri Shah. Has, has absolutely, absolutely needs a big round of applause from all of us. Thank you. Now I'm right, I'm going to to give him a bouquet of flowers right now on behalf of Eddie Rice. I'm going to say I love India and I, I wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Prime Minister Modi being so powerful in the clean energy sector, I think. Uh, we cover India probably more than any market other than the US. And thanks a lot to, to Modi and the other ministers. Thank you.
global examples now, I mean, globally, it might not be easy for you to see, but outside of the US and Europe, we're looking at Odi and this team as examples for the rest of the world. So great work you're doing. Energy, 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 energy,